media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Hi, Jim. Always be good to be with you and to our listeners. And uh, we've got some questions. Uh, quite a few this week, and we don't mind answering them. And we ask people, try to keep your question as brief as possible. It's a question, not a statement, remember, yep. uh, for those playing at home. Mm-hmm. From Michael. Hi, Jim and Bob. Many financial experts are saying there's too much liquidity chasing too few assets. They point to the Fed's reverse repo operations as being intended to soak up excess liquidity. But the financial experts also maintain that the Fed will continue to operate their high-speed printers so as to flush money into the financial system to boost asset prices. This all seems schizophrenic to me, Bob. What's going on here? Right, (laughs) Michael, yeah. The idea of liquidity at the top of a speculative market is really interesting because you got bids all over the place for every hot item. But the problem is most hot items are being traded leverage where people are cranking up the margin. So it gives the appearance of liquidity. As to what the Fed's doing with repo forwards or backwards, who the hell knows what's going on there. But you can be assured that they want to keep the party going and their uh, only rule they have there is that you keep the party going by flushing it with lots of uh, liquidity so uh, but then the irony is is that uh, the uh, a, a great speculative bubble always ends and then overwhelms the ability of the fed to try and keep it going and often that time is discovered in the fall so this is where we're content with the rally uh, right out to somewhere around mid-year. We've called it the sunshine. And then maybe August it turns to twilight, and then we've taken the theme a little further uh, that after in the fall we're going to see a return of one of those twilight zone horror story things. So it was going to be interesting. Thanks for the question. From Henry Solomon in El Paso. He writes, this question is directed to the esteemed economics historian Bob Hoy. Uh, Maybe we've got him confused with you. Uh, (laughs) No weekend is complete without listening to the well-moderated podcast of Bob Hoy hosted by HowStreet.com. Mr. Hoy has stated that three- to four-year high-quality U.S. corporate notes are a viable investment at present since short-term interest rates are effectively close to zero. But Mr. Hoy has also stated we are nearing a period of deflation during which most asset classes will decline in value. If serious deflation is close at hand, then would it be best to hold off on purchases of three- to four-year high-quality U.S. corporate bonds until deflation is upon us, perhaps later in the autumn of this year? Yeah, thanks, Henry. Uh, It's a matter of timing and how much you're going to put in. I mean, you... You, uh, you've, uh, right at the moment, you're effectively zero for T-bill and that sort of thing. And one day might just well go out and grab some of the four to five year stuff, but you'll be getting a higher income. And then it's a relatively safe place. You know, the bond price is going to swing around, but uh, they all mature at some point, three years hence or four years hence, and that then gets cranked into the behavior of the yield so it's to me an ideal position for when the storm comes and it just depends on how you're going to 
position yourself in it all at once or put a little in now and a little later in, into, uh, as I say, around three to four year treasuries so or the three to four year good grade uh, corporate bonds. And for Canadians in our audience, it's uh, the, you get the added that uh, the U.S. dollar will likely uh, rise relative to the Canadians, so you get an extra bit of a return out of it. So uh, actually, it's quite an attractive idea. From Cecil. Hi, Bob. How do you interpret this past week's sudden gold action and decline in light of your view on gold in both the short and longer term? You predict the price of gold will rise in a post-bubble contraction. Is that regardless of whether interest rates are rising or falling? Or is it really about the easily measured uh, era where we have distorted inflation metrics? Well, actually... Are we going to say Cecil or Cecil? <laughs> Whatever you like. He hasn't uh, cl- given we us a pronounce. We haven't had any complaints, and we welcome Cecil Cecil to the show. Um, the point to be made about gold is that my references to it are usually to gold's real price, as deflated by the CPI. And in a financial mania... In the past, the deflated price of gold has gone down, and gold stocks have underperformed the market. And this has been the case since July a year ago, when the rally in the gold sector just became so powerful, measurably, uh, technically overdone. So our advice then to both traders and investors was to take some money off the table, because it was just so good. And as it turned out, uh, we've had the the bubble into this year, and gold's real price has gone down, and the gold stocks have underperformed. But this is the point is to look ahead. And the when the deflation comes in, the post-bubble deflation, and it will, then that will move gold's real price up, which in, improves the profitability of gold mining and thus makes gold the next really great sector. So, uh, But there's an entry point coming up. We're not buying gold stocks now. We're waiting for the flush out. So, But here's an interesting point is that the uh, as you have a credit contraction, all the new bubble items of credit just sort of disappear, and the normal instruments like good grade corporates and treasuries, they it contracts. The credit contracts, and uh, but so then the the street and the banking system is needing liquidity, so to speak, and it happens automatically as gold's real price goes up. It's more profitable. It makes mining more profitable, and production increases and Despite what the crazy central bankers say, that increasing liquidity from a rising real price of gold gets into the banking system and starts to restore liquidity when uh, all of the crazy items created during the bubble are kind of disappearing or contracting. Good questions. Thank you. Caden from Mississauga asks, since the liquidity injections of QE started in 2008-9, the markets haven't entered a real bearish period. Prior to that, we'd see the markets correct 30-40% over a period of a year or more. Does Bob believe that Fed intervention has created a new norm, where stock markets suffer large crashes but don't fully enter bear markets? Case in point, the pandemic crash of 2020, which recovered within five weeks to new all-time highs. Yeah, some good points. The um, These great financial manias have all lasted around a decade from when you had the last huge high in global commodity prices, which was 2011. And at that time, uh, we ran the uh, the deflated price of, oh, copper, lead, uh, zinc, you know, virtually all of them. And we had a 100-year chart on that. So the percent gains in the real price of base metals, as an example, rose hugely. And it was something like twice the best gain ever in in a 100-year period. So that then was clearly 
the big global commodity high, and in which case, a decade later, you'd expect a huge mania in stocks and other financial assets to go crazy. And it has gone crazy. So this year, 2021, on the decade count, was likely to see uh, uh, the culmination of the bubble. Then within that, in January, we noted that uh, there was an interesting count on the growth of uh, New York Stock Exchange margin debt, which reached that rate of growth in November. So then what happens is once you reach that and, and that rate of growth in New York Stock Exchange margin debt, about six months later, you can have the actual peak in the stock market. And six months from November counts out to kind of around May. And there, we've had a spectacular peak in the Bitcoin thing. And, and so we're, this is where we're looking for topping action in the senior indexes. Senior indexes now. So the bull market lasts for a decade with substantial corrections in it. And then once the bubble is over, which it, it appears to be working on now, now then this is where you get a very serious cyclical bear market, and this will really show up in the numbers. So uh, actually, that uh, good question. Thanks a lot. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, some headlines that caught your attention today. Uh, the first one, hedge funds get it wrong with ill-timed dollar and bank bets or I should say dollar and bond bets. Yeah. Yeah, they were all on to the inflation story, and we just took a look uh, at the bond future, and it had crashed down to 154 and was very oversold. So then in looking back on the pattern of bond uh, prices setting uh, a base, um, it did. Maybe four or five months, you'd expect to set the base. And then the base is completed as the price of the bond future rises above its 20-week exponential moving average, which is very close to happening now. Now, we also use that, uh, now that covers the bond, but we also used it on the, uh, on the U.S. dollar. The, the DX, uh, in January got extremely oversold. And then it uh, bounced back and then spent uh, all the time since building one of these bases that we look to see. These things can last about, oh, I think the last time I did the work was sort of like four and a half months of base building for the U.S. dollar. And then when it rises above its own 20-week EMA, that completes the base building. And we have had that in the in the U.S. dollar. So the base is in. And it's acting very well, whereas the the most popular trade was the, oh, inflation is back, the Fed's gone crazy, and it'd be even crazier with the Biden administration. This was all factored into uh, huge uh, uh, price increases for everything. But actually, when you look at the market, with a flat trending U.S. dollar for six months, the rise in in lumber, for example, or copper, that was due to the demand that you get with the business boom uh, that is associated with the final stage of the bubble. So if this was the huge inflation that they're talking about, the uh, me- uh, lumber and metal prices would be still going up and the dollar would still be going down. So it's 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 very interesting here. And it's I like the headline where 
many of the hedge funds got in the popular trade, and it's not working for them. Glencore CEO says commodity prices will still be elevated. Yeah, Glencore is the huge uh, base metal and petroleum company. I mean, this this is really a huge outfit. And, of course, they got to talk their book. But and it is also that the popular opinion is, is that inflation's coming back, 1970s type of inflation and prices up forever. And, nope, I don't think so. But it shows uh, just how intense and how widely spread the conviction has been. Another headline that caught your eye, copper prices will climb so high you'll need a telescope to see them. Yeah, that was by Robert Friedland, the very, very successful mine uh, financial guy and promoter. He's been terrific. But, hey, it's a colorful statement that copper prices are going to go so high you need a telescope to see them. I liked it. But uh, I think not. Uh, the uh, uh, Five or six weeks ago, copper prices uh, were technically overdone i mean really overdone as and and uh, lumber was even greater then there were a few of the grains uh, corn and soybeans became exceptionally overdone and these things even on simple um, momentum basis the rsi became the best since guess what 2011 but we consider that this is this these price rises were associated with the business boom that attends a great financial mania. And there's seasonalities involved here. So uh, after August, we're going to be looking for seasonal declines. Now, crude oil can keep going for a while here yet. And, uh, but, uh, and it, we, wa- we will be watching for it to create some ex- technical excesses. I mean, that's the way this world works. So, but after August, then you got seasonal declines for copper down into November. Seasonal weakness for lumber, often into October. And then for crude oil, it's seasonal weakness is often into January or February. And I think that some of these seasonal weaknesses could become quite bleak, basically because it's been so hot lately and it's become the popular trade. So it's going to be very interesting to watch, Jim. If you want a used truck for your business or just for your personal use, you're in tough with prices rising and supplies falling. What's going on there? Oh, yeah. Used truck prices are exploding on feverish demand and lack of of supply. Well, of course, when crazed authoritarian governments shut everything down on the COVID alarm, I mean, it really did shut down a lot of uh, production of many different things. And uh, so there was a, uh, they just stopped production of cars and trucks and everything else. So, and then, of course, with the straight down in the hit to the financial markets and then the straight up, which was, I think the straight up is actually reflecting the uh, business expansion that attends the final stages of a great financial mania. So, again, another sensational headline with sensational events going on, and many would take this rise in prices of of uh, trucks, uh, and also you're getting a huge rise in prices for used cars and pickup trucks i mean this is it's been impressive but then you have uh, unusual uh, accommodation going on by central bankers who when their counterparts in government mess ups who shut everything down they of course stepped in and provided all kinds of liquidity into the system and then at the same time you had various governments in the u.s the they called them stimmies, uh, sending out stimulus checks to everybody such that it became they were getting more money by for staying home than they would if they went to work with a job. So you've got craziness, Jim, out there. I mean, really crazy stuff going on. But it's within the context of a great financial mania. So even without 
the distortions of COVID and things like that, it would have been crazy. And each of the ones in the past get equivalently crazy. And then finally all the players are in, every, all the speculators are highly leveraged, they're exhausted, and uh, nobody else left to move the prices up. And then the power shifts from the central bankers over to the margin clerks, and their a job description is to get the accounts in line no matter what. And it's the way it's been throughout the last 300 years is that the central bank is on the party side, so let's twist it around and say they want to get all of the accounts leveraged up in the party, which is a vastly dis- different job description to that of a margin clerk, and his mandate is to get the accounts in line. So this is where probably uh, after September we'll see this struggle um, being brought into the financial markets again, and um, I would stay with financial history that uh, when you've had this kind of a mania in, in financial asset prices, the... Uh, it has always been followed by a severe bear market for both stocks and uh, low-grade uh, bonds, and let's not overlook uh, basic commodities, too. So it's going to be very interesting after August, Jim. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us, and try to stay cool this weekend. Uh, the lower mainland, the greater Vancouver area, expecting temperatures up to 39 degrees celsius or 102 fahrenheit well i'll believe it when i see it jim my outdoor thermometer here now is saying 73 degrees and i will let you know if it gets to 100 it's 26 degrees celsius here in new westminster so that's about 76 fahrenheit yeah well actually inside now we're going to give our listeners all of the dope Inside here, my office, with the windows open and the patio door open and everything else, it's 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25.6 Celsius. Now, how's that for providing service, Jim? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We don't need those pretty TV weather forecasters. We can do it, Bob. We got it all right here in-house for sure. Have a great weekend. You too. Talk to you later. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy, the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. If you have any questions for Bob, he loves to answer them. Send them to info at howstreet.com, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.